In the light of the moon, a little egg lay on a leaf. One Sunday morning, the warm sun came up and pop! Out of the egg came a tiny and very hungry caterpillar. Does anybody know these lines? It's not a story that Jesus told, I'll give you that to <laughs> It's from the Gospel according to Eric Palm, and it's the first lines of the very hungry caterpillar. Now, in case you haven't ever read this book, and it's not a weighty read, I mean, have a look. <laughs> um, a very hungry caterpillar eats its way through various healthy fruits and vegetables, uh, before going off the rails a bit on Saturday and eating everything in sight, including Swiss cheese, cherry pie, chocolate cake, ice cream, everything, basically. Uh, the caterpillar recovers by eating a nice green leaf and then makes a cocoon, before eventually transforming into a beautiful butterfly. Considering harvest made me think about this book, and not just because I read far more children's books than theology books. Um, the caterpillar is provided with the most wonderful array of fruits to help it grow. It hasn't done anything to deserve them, it hasn't worked for them. It just needs them, so the fruits are provided for them. On Saturday, the caterpillar's appetite gets out of hand. It is wasteful, and dare I say it's a little greedy. This approach to the wonderful gifts the caterpillar has been given does not pay off, and it ends up making him ill. When the caterpillar goes into the cocoon, it is enormous. It has done all it can do as a caterpillar, and the time has come for it to change. I think there are many lessons for us here in trusting in what God provides, appreciating what we are given, and realising that what we are given helps us to make us what we are truly meant to be. I find the image of a cocoon fascinating. <coughs> Inside a cocoon or pupa, the caterpillar is broken down. Many of its cells die completely, and in the pressure of the pupa, it is reformed as a butterfly. Since the early church, the butterfly has been a Christian symbol, and I think it's easy to understand why. There is some parallel between Jesus entering the tomb and his glorious resurrection, but also it inspires us how we may be transformed by God. So many people are able to relate to that feeling of being forced in, restricted or even having their very selves eroded away. But also many people who have come through times like that will tell of how it made them the person they are today, and that even in the darkest times, God was at work changing their lives for the better. I don't want to be flippant about this. When we are going through these bleak times, it is usually not helpful to have some chirpy, well-meaning person say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> but I do believe in the very hardest times, God is with us, willing our suffering to end. I've also witnessed how God gives us gifts to help us use these cocoon times, to help us become something greater than we were before, to shift our focus onto new life and new possibilities. Let's take our first reading as a starting point. It begins with the glorious first line. Do not fear, O soil. I mean, it's great. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Just think about the very soil, the earth, rejoicing at the wonderful things God has done. Growing up in the countryside, I went to some great harvest festivals as a child. But I never got the image that even the soil praises God. Yeah, yeah. The beginning of the Joel reading tells us about a time when all creation is rejoicing at the abundance of good gifts. Every land is lush and green. All the 
the trees are the most fruit-filled they've ever been, and all the stores of grain and oil are full to bursting. I have to say that I felt a little sad when I read this, even though it's a reading about joy and celebration. To be honest with you, I am not very connected with where my food comes from. And if our countryside was filled with fruit and vegetables, full to bursting, I'm not sure I'd know about it. Since moving into our house, we have discovered all sorts of things growing in the garden, including lots that's edible. But I'm sure that I'm only aware of a tiny proportion of what is growing just a few feet away from where I sit and eat Maltesers. This feeling of connection is important, perhaps especially in an area like this where we aren't so entwined with the natural world on a daily basis. It helps us to remember that we are part of a whole, and that as such we work with all of creation to reveal God's presence. In the summer, I spent a day in North Northumberland, where they are setting up a mission initiative a bit like mine. <coughs> of course, it's very, very different to where we are here. And it being very rural, many of the people connected with the church are dependent on the land for their well-being. I went for a day thinking about rural poverty, and the fear of what the future holds for rural communities was very real. This year has seen a bad winter, poor lambing, drought, storms, as well as the reality that agriculture will be especially badly hit by Brexit. I was shocked by some of the statistics, and there were many, but I will just share this one with you that has stayed with me. In Northumberland, the developmental gap at age three between children raised in the most wealthy ward in that county and the children raised in the poorest ward in that county is 11 months. There is 11 months difference in children's development at age three, depending on where they're raised. Imagine how that inequality affects them as they grow. Having this more realistic vision of rural life, as well as our reality in Bycliffe, the abundance of the reading in Joel seems very far away. It's all very well having these ideals, but the difficulties of life usually get in the way of us seeing them in action. However, I think God addresses this in the Joel reading. This vision of the future of plenty comes to a people who have known suffering. Their crops have been destroyed by locusts and armies, I think what God is saying is, I have seen you in the cocoon. I have seen you being broken down, under great pressure, but the day of your transformation is coming. The abundance will be so great that all people and animals will be well fed. Even the soil will praise God. It's about hope. But hope that isn't ignorant as a pain of life, what perhaps used to be called blind hope, it's hope that is informed by struggle. Our Gospel reading has a similar message. Jesus challenges us not to worry, to trust that our well-being is in God's hands. I find this a really hard teaching, worrying is something I give a disproportionate amount of time to. I can't imagine telling someone who was struggling to feed and clothe their family to just trust in God. However, the care that is expressed in this passage is something that is clear. If God provides for the birds, how much more will God give to us to ensure that we are as free as they are? If God sees every tiny flower in bloom, how much more is God willing us to blossom and reach our potential? If God transforms a very hungry caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly, 
how much more will we be changed into our true selves? God made us to be colourful and beautiful in every sense. God is calling us to leave our dead selves in the cocoon. Harvest reminds us of God's love for all that God has made. God loves every tomato that goes into a can of soup. God loves every baked bean, every grain of rice. God values creation to that extent, so should we. That is why we give thanks for all that God provides to keep us going day by day, and for the farmers who, as we know, work in incredibly difficult circumstances to produce it. Harvest also reminds us that everything we have is through the grace of God. Of course, when we have little, this can be difficult to trust in. If we are lucky enough to have plenty, we should remember that it is God's vision that the world should have enough, even down to the caterpillars and the birds. It is not part of God's ideal for us to build up storehouses for ourselves. Instead, as the body of Christ, we must take seriously our obligation to provide for others who have not been given the abundance of God's provision. If God cares about every person having what they need to fulfill their potential, then so should we. I reiterate, this is not an easy thing to live. The reality of sacrificing our luxuries, our security, perhaps even some of what we consider to be necessities, to share the good things God has provided is a hard task. But surely if we are to have hope in a future where all get to experience that transformation into their free, true selves, then this is what we must strive to do. Finally, this is what I want to focus on. Harvest is traditionally a time of plenty, when all has been gathered in and the hard work of the year is over and all its benefits can be enjoyed. Of course, as farmers have seen this year, things don't always go to plan. At its most basic though, harvest gives us a glimpse of the future we are hoping for when Christ comes to reign. There will be no hunger, no poverty. The trees will reach their potential as producers of fruit. The soil reaches its potential as a producer of crops. And we reach our potential as children of God. We will be gathered in. And we will see clearly then what we can only glimpse now. God's love and abundance for all. We must remember that we are not spectators in this harvest. We are workers. And as we look upon the gifts we are given today, we commit ourselves to appreciating God's creation more, to trusting in God's love for us, and for challenging ourselves to share in more of those good things that we have been given. Only then will we see ourselves and others transformed, just like the very hungry caterpillars. Amen. Amen.